The newly signed data protection law by President Tunubu is said to have capacity of providing 500,000 initial jobs. We'll find out about the Tunubu's digital job plans tonight. And the National Security Advisor, Musa Nuhu Rebado, second of all from his predecessor, Babangana Mungunu, today in Abuja. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the program. This is Politics Today, live on Channels Television. I'm Sean Akimale in Abuja. What a good way for us to begin the new week, everyone. And let's get talking about your major national stories and politics. Let's begin by letting you know that Mr. Nungu Rebado is today officially taking over the mantle of leadership uh, as uh, in, uh, I mean, within the security uh, um, sector in Nigeria as a national security advisor. He's taking over from General Babangana Mugunu as the new Nigeria's national security advisor at a brief event in Abuja. Mr. Rabadu, an assumption of office, promised to live up to the expectations of Nigerians and secure the country from all forms of insecurity, such as terrorism, banditry, kidnapping, amongst others. He said, quote, we will stabilize this country, we will secure our country, and we will make Nigeria peaceful because we believe time has come for this country to enjoy peace, we saw order and rule of law just like any other country in the world. End of quote. From that, we've got so much more for you tonight on the program. Of course, those of you who are looking forward to the Salah celebration, well, the federal government has declared a public holiday. We'll be bringing you details of that. Plus, I have a senator who abandoned the PDP. There is a reason why he did that. There's going to be a governorship election coming in Edo State. He's one of the most senior when it comes to politics in that state at the moment in the PDP. We'll be finding out what is really going on in the PDP world, getting his own views on the state of the nation, the Tunubu presidency, and how things are going. Plus, one of the promises made by President Tunubu is the fact that it's going to provide at least one million jobs within the digital sector. Now, with the signing of the data protection law, there is a possibility of an initial 500,000 jobs to be provided. Where would that be coming from? Do we really need some of these new agencies of government when we're talking about cost of governance? We'll be getting uh, insight into the protection of your private information and your data we finding out tonight on the program so stick around with me it's going to be uh, of a packed program but first we need to check out your political random stories the vice president senator kashim shitima has decorated the new controller general of the nigeria customs service mr adewali adeni in a short ceremony witnessed by the Chief of Staff to the President, Mr. Femi Bajabia Mila, at the State House in Abuja, the Vice President described the appointment of a new CG by President Bola Chinubu as a morale booster for officers in the service. Speaking to journalists shortly after the decoration ceremony, Mr. Adeni expressed gratitude to President Chinubu for appointing a serving officer as the head of the agency. We intend to come up with a number of innovations that would help to uh, carry along uh, those stakeholders, those partners. Uh, we're going to leverage technology. We're going to try and use those innovative technologies to break new grants in customs operations. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, Right Honorable Tajuddin Abbas, believes that unless Nigeria strengthens its rule of law and the fight against corruption, the country would not go anywhere. This was contained in a statement from the office of the speaker signed by his special advisor on media, Musa Kershi. According to the statement, the speaker made the comment at a reception organized in his honor by the Nigeria High Commission in London on Sunday night. One of such ways, according to Honorable Abbas, would be to look at the living wage of workers. 
He wants it enhanced so the workers can get a sense of justice and fairness, which should encourage them to be honest and transparent in their dealings. Ahead of the November 11 governorship election in Nimo State, the Labour Party candidate says the party will not allow political thugs to steal votes or disrupt the election process. The Labour Party governorship candidate, Senator Athan Achonu, stated this when he met with some Imo State indigents in Abuja. Senator Achonu is confident that the Independent National Electoral Commission will ensure the election is free and fair. I have a level of confidence in INF and I believe that we are going to be able to protect our votes. Nobody can tamper with our vote. A member representing Jajire constituency and former chairman, House Committee on Finance and Appropriation in the 7th Assembly, Buba Tiroma Masio, has been unanimously elected as a speaker of the Yobe State 8th Assembly. The new speaker emerged unopposed after he was nominated by Adamu Dala Dogo, a member representing Karasua constituency and seconded by Buba Kalalawa. A group under the ages of the Voice of the Voiceless has held protests at the headquarters of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, Abuja, demanding the probe and immediate arrest of the immediate past governor of Zamfara State, Mohamed Bello Matawale, over allegations of financial impropriety to the tune of 70 billion naira. The protesters, led by Mr. Nasiru Doka, urged the EFCC to reopen its earlier investigation into the former governor's tenure, which was aborted because of the constitutional immunity clause protecting him while in office. Thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us. Let's quickly bring you up to speed. The fact that, uh, to, not tomorrow, for those of you who have already traveled, but on Wednesday and Thursday, that is when the federal government has declared a public holiday. That's the 28th of, um, 29th of June, 2023. Uh, it's been declared officially as a public holiday to celebrate the Ida Cabri holidays. Well, another information from uh, the federal government is the fact that the uh, president uh, today made public the renaming of some federal airports after several notable Nigerians. This is contained in a memo by the Federal Ministry of Aviation, which was dated the 1st of June 2023 and signed by one of the top officials in that ministry. The statement made available to China's television earlier today notes that the president named the airport as part of reforms of the aviation sector. The Madiguri Airport has now been renamed after the immediate past president, Mohamed Buhari. And the Port Harcourt Airport, after the late nationalist of Bafemi Awolawa, by the Nasrawa Airport, immortalized the late founder of the Sokoto Caliphate, Usman Danfodio. Also, the Benin Airport was renamed after the late Oba of Benin, Oba Akenzua II. The Bonny Airport, after the late Senate President, Chuba Okadibo. And the Ibadan Airport, after the late Premier of the Old Western Region, Chief Ladoki Akintola. A full list of the renamed airports and those whose names have we now carry on the air, those airports is available on our website, chinastv.com. Uh, more reactions have continued to trail the actions and activities of President Tunubu since assuming office on the 29th of May 2023. Tonight, I'll be speaking with a former federal lawmaker from Edo State who uh, recently announced his exit from the People's Democratic Party. He's one of the most senior uh, in that party in Edo State, perhaps one of those who you can call the spine of the PDP in Edo State, those who welcome Governor Baseki into the PDP when the governor moved from the APC to the PDP in the thick of the battle uh, for the president's re-election. Senator Matthew Rohide is being a senator in the 8th and 9th National Assembly. Thank you so much, Senator, for joining us. Thank you very much, Shem. Why did you Good to see you again. It's good to see you too. Thank you. Why did you leave your party? PDP. PDP, yes. Uh, well, first, let me say that uh, uh, the constitutional provisions that we have, it was the right to associate. Mm -hmm. And of course, the right to, to dissociate. So, it matters on my own fundamental rights. Yeah, that decision. It may not have gone down well uh, with some persons, but they must understand that it is my rights which I've expressed. 
And you ask me why. Uh, when I did a letter, you know, to the Senate President on the floor of the Senate, just before, you know, the, the break of the night Senate, the same letter was communicated to the acting chairman of the party, the national chairman, acting national chairman. At the same time, the state chairman got my letter and my watch chairman got the letter. I stated in that letter very clearly that as a Democrat, what that one means is you get into an association, political party, you must freely mix, you must freely do those things that you believe in. I will believe that when you put, when you put ideas together, we all share the same ideas. And then of course the ideas go into philosophy after that, of course, it goes to ideology. That is really the basis, you know, for membership of a political movement or a political party. But I left because some of the things that had happened in PDP, with the knowledge of every Nigerian, both at national level and state level, where things, to my mind, were becoming unbearable, unwarranted, unnecessary, and of course put the party in a very difficult position. And I just chose not to be named amongst them. What was happening at the national level? You saw it. What happened? Remember the PCC, we went around it, we were hoping that things were going to change for the better. Never did. Where do you think and that? We didn't, and we didn't <laughs> learn from the history of the past. You know? Where, went, do you, where, where do you think things went wrong at the national level during the campaign? When, uh, when, the, when the, the G5, as they are called, you know, the governors, said that they were not going to give support to the candidature of Elijah Tiku. They gave their reason. And the reason was that now that we have moved the presidency to the north, we have chosen a candidate from the north, therefore the chairmanship of the party should come to the south. And they were insisting on now it should happen before the election. And then, of course, the incumbent national chairman said no until after the election. And we got it wrong. So, for some of you who are very senior politician, I mean, in a few years you'll be 70. I mean, you've got yes. your teeth. Yes. You've seen it all. Yes. I mean, did you warn about the, what could be an imminent danger? Because you said the party has definitely not learned from the past. Yes. You see, the, the, the funny thing is, you know, the present uh, work committee, national work committee of the party, most of them are my very good friends. You know, and... Uh, you know it is recurring thing that uh, senators, former senators always come in, you know, to these positions. So, Senator Samaya, for instance, the National Secretary of the Party, was with us in the ESL, you know, and a host, of, a host of others, you know, were with us. The National Police Secretary, the National Auditor, all of them, are friends, but you see, when you, when you talk in harsh tones, or well, nobody really wants to bear the card, that's the problem. We said, look, this thing that is happening, can it not just be treated so that it can put, off, put us in a better state when the election. I mean, so and the, when, the, when that, the, one, that yeah. one missed, when, when we missed that. Was well, the G5 sort, sort of uh, a breaker, a backbreaker for the PDP for yeah. this election? Nobody, nobody can underscore that at all. Not only the G5, the other things you know, in the PDP. For instance, the exit of, of Peter Obi from the party. You remember the point of exit for him was almost immediately after the primaries, you know? And of course, it filtered out that, um, you know, so the governors have said that, you know, the, the, the vice president or the vice presidential candidate must come from amongst them. And of course, he thought of you too that he didn't have a chance. So he needed to leave. And if you remember, when we were at the Portacourt primaries, if you remember, you were there. Mm -hmm. You talked to a few of us. Mm -hmm. And that time, when he, was, when he was eventually picked, you know, after we got the candidate, you know, and Peter Abu was picked. Some of the governors, particularly the Southeast governors, kicked, kicked against him. So when they now came again and they said, no, it cannot be Peter Obi, you know, of course, the man had to go to, had to, go to other pastors. But those who have said that if Peter Obi had remained in the PDP and in fact become the running mate to Atiku Abubakar, he probably would not, wouldn't have made the kind of mark he made by being a, a Labour Party presidential candidate. Well, Do you that, think so? That is a very sound, sound you know, school of thought. But we should have allowed it to happen because we're replicating what had happened in 2019. So if Peter B had remained, there were, there were possibility of... Because what we had been would have been. 
the voice that Peter Obi got, whether I mean from popularity or from whatever happened to him, the PDP and leaving the place or not, he would have of course been able to bring in votes. So and look at the difference. So the election was for articles winning before sure, the election. Sure. Well, even the APC acknowledged it. That it was the division. Even the S Y president. You know, uh, uh, Muhammad Buhari acknowledged it, that it was the division inside the PDP that cost our, you know, that cost our loss. So, PD, you see, I think it is not lose, like some APC members have said, I've had your very good brother, Adam Soshomali, on, on this platform who said, look, the APC, uh, the PDP did not lose uh, the election. Uh, I mean, I, I'm trying to remember exactly the way he put it now. I mean, sort of saying that uh, the PDP actually lost the election by themselves. You know, not because of anybody, uh, you know, uh, knocking them out, but they had lost the election even before the election. Well, of course, yes, that's what he was referring to. Because the house was divided against itself. I mean, if, if you look at thing, it, the with the benefit in the of door. hindsight, Senator, yes. with the benefit of hindsight, if you look at it, what do you think could have been done better before that election? Let me say this. Even though the governors were overbearing hmm, by the action, Insisting that the, the, the National Chairman of the Party, you know, step down. Of course, we know the reason. All right? So when they felt bad through that, maybe they were not made, you know, the vice presidential, you know, candidate. But at least we should have avoided any rancor that was going to arise, you know, from the decision to pick another person. And the only thing to do before the election was, okay, good. If it will take me my exit, by stepping aside for the party to win, why not? Could Senator, are you to have st stepped down for the sake of the ticket and the party? I, I don't know what persuaded him against. But knowing him, he's a gentleman. He's a, he's, he's a very simple If you were Senator, are you, would you have stepped down? I would have stepped down. Mm. Yeah. But, I would have what was important to the party was to win the election. Every other thing would fall into place. So it was an own goal for the PDP? I, I, I presume so. And what's happened there, it could happen in the States, mm. even in our States. In Edo? Yes. I mean, you had the same experience. Of course, PDP, PDP came third. PDP came third in Edo. But Labour Party... Was, for the presidential candidate, for the presidential election. The, the Labour Party became a force that even the PDP in Edo State could not withstand. Yes. And, uh, I mean, this your resignation, have you had a conversation with Governor Basaki about it? No. I thought he was your friend. My very good friend. You're I one have of the leaders who welcome in the party. Sure, sure. So I have, did. Have, have you guys, I mean, are you guys still good? Well, you see, let me say, we are still very good. I don't know, I don't know otherwise until maybe I was starting to hear, you know, certain utterances so, because from, I'm wondering. From, from, from some of the boys, you know, that work in government house, you know. I mean, trying to cast aspersions on my own service in the National Assembly. I mean, my records are on pilot, you know. Nobody really can take it away from me. So when they said, oh, Rogi, they didn't do anything, it only means you're just dancing to bad music. And because I'm wondering, it, bad it closes, because things. I know the role yourself and the likes of Danobi and the, the likes yes. played yes. welcoming of Norbasaki into the PDP in Edo State that during the re-election. So I'm wondering how Governor Basaki is not aware that you are leaving the PDP. So let me say this, you know, um, I want to respect, you know, the friendship that I have with the governor. This back about, you know, over 55, 55 years ago. And then, of course, I really must respect his office as the governor of the states. I have nothing against him, and I will not have anything against him. Even if I feel offended, I would have gone to him. I don't believe he offended me. But what happened in the party was the irreconcilable difference that had existed in the party. That was very close to me. We went to school together. We fought for the PDP together. We built the platform together. And then, of course, I went out of my way, out of every other person, you know, to get my brother, the governor, okay, from what had happened between him and uh, Comrade Adam Shomale, to come to our party and use the platform. And we stood out. I was his coordinator in Edo South, all right, that turned in the majority of the votes, 81,000 votes difference, you know, because it won 84,000 votes. We did everything for him to win. And then, of course, I was not caught midway. For my, for my friends that we built a party together, they said, it was you that insisted on, 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 on coming to the party. 
All right? They gave me the plan. And I told them, I have no regrets. So there are some people. It was our are, shortest course. Some people are not happy with Governor no. Baseke at the moment. From the PDP, mm -hmm. the, the group we call the legacy PDP, they are not happy with him because they believe they didn't share power with him after mm -hmm. we won the election. And they now held me responsible. But there are some, and that was what cost, that yeah. was what probably The Commissioner cost. of Information in the PD, in, the, in Edo State yes. was a publicity secretary of, yeah, of the PDP. Of the PDP. Yes, yes. And, and, and there, are, there are a few people that I know who were in on initially in the PDP that are now working in government. So yes. you wonder where the grievance will be coming from. You know, you see, I think grievance is actually genuine and they you found see, it. You see, let me tell you something. There, there's been a pattern, you know, I mean, you know, a tradition. When you struggle for power, a party gets power. It doesn't matter who symbolizes the leadership as governor or as president. When you win it, you come back and include the party to share power, all right? That has been, it when we like won the election in the state, our part of the group, we sat down and we decided who gets, who gets what, all right? And the whole thing was shared. All those who labor, including Chief Anini, who was on the other side, he brought three commissioners to the government of Adam Shumale. But in the Governor Basaki's case? Well, that is, that is what Danobi, my friend, and the others are saying. We didn't sit down to share power. But now that you left the PDP, are you resigning from politics totally? No. Or you're just waiting to see what is going to happen? No, I'm just waiting. Let me tell you something. I had tried my best to cause reconciliation. Let us forget about what has happened. Even if you are not happy with the governor or the way things have gone, it's not going to be governor forever. Okay? Everybody has a style. Let us tolerate it. For me, I'm a moderate. Okay? And I said, let us just go ahead. Get these things done. Keep our party intact. All right? So that tomorrow, whatever it is, we'll still be able to fight and get the party to win elections. And on the governor's side, I tried to, to let's bring these people, let us all come together. I kept on talking about the council. Are, are you, are you but when they refused and got to the point of the election, mm. where a segment of the PDP had to go and support the APC against the PDP, I knew with the average end. Would you be working, for example, with someone like Comrade Adam Soshemale of the APC now as they prepare for the governorship election? Well, let me say this. Nothing is impossible in politics. Nothing is impossible. Your relationship it's with my friend. is very good? Why not? Mm. My friend. Let me take you to national politics. Yes. Uh, it's a margin today. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of reactions on the few subsidy remover. But there is a statement from pres former President Muhammad Buhari saying that if he had removed few subsidy, Bolatinobu may have lost the election. Do you think so? Uh, you see, there are certain decisions that are very difficult to take you know, when we're in, when we're in power, mm. we're in government. You know, um, and that is why the, people always say, if you have the political will, you have the political will, all right? Um, I want to say that the president really didn't have a, a political will. Otherwise, if he, had, if he had removed subsidy, you know, in his time, I don't think the heavens would have fallen. Because the arguments were very sound, all right? that we needed to do something about subsidy. And the subsidy issue had become um, a big sore, particularly when we are talking of the very scarce resources that we have in our country. I was in the Senate, Senate Committee Chairman on Public Accounts. Mm -hmm. At a time in the East Senate, we, invest, we investigated you know, the consumption of, pet, of, of uh, PMS all right, in the country. The figures were not just right. And to think of it that NMPC needed to pay all right, the subsidy has some that recovery for us, and uh, whatever was the balance was what now coming to the federation account. We saw the loopholes. Mm. Then why don't we remove the subsidy? How many we know? Yes, in the issue of public transportation, that is where we are really talking about the big greater majority of our people. But how many persons, our rural populace, that are that still constitute a greater majority, are they? Do they enjoy? anything for subsidy. And also, the sharp practices that were involved, you know, in the payment of subsidies. There are a lot of people, so, I mean, that, that the reports that say that there are highly placed Nigerians who are involved in this racketeering, this subsidy. I mean, the benefit for a few against the interests of the majority. I mean, why, how is it difficult to be able to bring these people to book? 
I don't know. I heard that uh, some persons are being prosecuted right now. Okay? Uh, um, some time ago, I read in the papers too that, um, you know, former, you know, one uh, where political party leader, the son is, you know, I mean, he's being prosecuted by the government and uh, they're in court, you know. And if there's anything, until, you know, we see the outcome, you know, of uh, such matters in court, we'll never know whether government really wants You are from the oil producing region. Yes. And you wonder how devastating the effect of oil exploration is to that region. Yes. And there are those who, say, who live within this region who say, they know, they see, the people who are involved, they see how they are building the, the kennels, the, the ships and all what have you that are being built to transport some of these uh, products yes. out. And so the community uh, uh, involvement also, the, the tacit involvement of leadership of some communities are also there. I mean, so this is far reaching into the fabric of the society, isn't it? Yes, it is. Let me say, um, in the Niger Delta region, I'm from Edo State. My, particular, well, my own central district, Edo South Central District, is the reason Edo State is, is named as a Niger Delta State. And I want to tell you too that um, all the activities that have been going on in Niger Delta is just a resort to self help. No matter how criminal those activities are. And of course, you cannot say there has not been collusion from high places. Okay? But I want to tell you, you know, with, with the advent of the Petroleum Industry Act, I was a member of uh, Petroleum Industry in the Senate. And we went around, you know, all over the place looking at all the provisions, you know, in the five chapters that make up the Petroleum Industry Act. I want to say that until we start to, you know, express the provisions, particularly as contained in chapter four, which has to do with the host communities. Until they start to get the benefit of having this natural resource, it's still going to be a problem. Mm. Okay, so what they were doing, if you are taking all the money for Elijah Niger Delta to go and build cities like Abuja and the rest, and we are seeing the luxury being flaunted by people who are not for Elijah Niger Delta, where are the, where are the, where are the hen that is, that is laying the golden egg? Why? So they decided to, to, I mean, to resort to self-help. I know that one is illegal. But what do you do? Now, look at the Act. We are going to now give 3% of the, of the running cost of the, of, the, of, the, of the investors, okay, to the host communities. And then, of course, with the 3% that are going to go to the host communities, we are, we are estimating that between 550 million to $800 million will go to the host communities, if we are managed at least to be able to meet some of the desires that were, you know, corporate, you know, um, uh, social responsibilities of the companies. But the devastating parts of it, mm. like gas flaring, the act provides that 100% of what is recovered or what is accruable as penalty to the IOCs and the NOCs and other investors in the region. That one should be given to the people to meet up with the deficit in their health standard and, of course, the remediation of their of the environment. So if these ones really are now being exercised and the people are happy, you don't no longer expect the local communities mm. to collude with people, either from within or outside the Niger Delta, you know, in this nefarious. Let, 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 let me anchor on this note. I mean, with your participation in the Public Accounts Committee and the, the debt burden that this nation has on its neck right now, there are warnings that in the Tinubu government must be careful yes. in the manner in which it approached the issue of borrowing yes. uh, compared to the re our revenue. In fact, there is a mark that the DMO has placed to say, if we must survive yes. as a people in this country, our revenue must get to that point. Yes. Uh, and I'd like you to kill two birds with a stone and just in about a minute uh, thereabout. Yes. What is your assessment of the one month of office in office by Bola Tinubu, and uh, in view of the very devastating or the very terrible state of our economy and the lack of buoyant revenue generation, where do you think we can turn to? Uh, so let me tell you, borrowing cannot help us. For the borrowing. Borrowing really cannot take us to the more desired. We're already in trouble anyways. Now listen, I mean, if you are having 50 trillion, you know what I mean? People have been banning figures of 7 trillion or 70 trillion. Okay, dead body from this country. 
my experience in National Assembly and the things I pursued very seriously were things, of course, that will make us to look inwards. I mean, everybody has said it, and it is true that the problem of this country is revenue. The problem of our country is not about borrowing money or even expenditure. Okay? We have tried to put extant acts and regulations in place to check expenditure. But the one of revenue has always been a problem. For public accounts, every year the Auditor General reports come. Uh, okay? And I mean, glory be to God that between 2015, which was a transition government between Buhari and, and, um, and Jonathan, we were able to look at the auditor report of this country in my committee. And we took it up to 2019, which is the last. I want to tell you, with you, with every modesty, since the advent of the Foreign Republic 1999, Public Accounts Committee never submitted any report for consideration by the Senator plenary. I did it all. I cleared it all. No wonder if you, if you watched our valedictory session. My vice chairman in my committee, you know, uh, Senator Adeja, you know, stood up and said, the one thing I have been able to gain in the fourth, in the fourth, I mean, in the ninth Senate, is the way Senator Urogidi, the chairman of our committee, discharged his duties to break the jinx of submitting reports, a general report, to the Senate, and the Senate adopted it and passed it. The same thing, Senator Lujimi stood up. All right? Senator Kwari stood up and said so. So, it is it's not even to feel, make me feel good, cool. What we have done, it is because of the provision of Section 88 and Section 89 of the Constitution. The National Assembly should expose corruption. If we expose corruption, now you have been able to bring all the transactions of government, okay, in a, in a, in a, in a I mean, financial year. And we have looked at agencies and individuals that have undermined our expenditure profile without due consideration to accountability, to uh, property, and then of course value for money. They did all of that. Now, when these reports came and we looked at them, we have exposed corruption. The, the Constitution does not say, what do we do when we expose corruption? So, before we left the Senate, I came up with a bill that was you know, co-sponsored by Senator, by Senator Adeja. He's the Deputy Chief, uh, Chief of Staff to the President now. I said, there must be implementation and enforcement of our recommendations. Mm. In the 2015 report, people have to refund over 2 point something trillion. Nothing has happened. The executive did not take any action. So these are areas that the now, government need to look into. They have to look into because, because it is the a lot of general's leakage. office indicted a lot of MDs. A lot. The 2019 and nobody report. has been held accountable. Not, nobody. There but, are hundreds of private organizations that are not even remitting what they, are, they need to be, so take to be remitting. So take and spend the whole thing when, of course, they are fully funded by government. So the they report and, 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 and the blueprint is there for the Tinubu government. Of course. Too. I've submitted my reports now in 2019. And, and okay. of course, the Senate has equally passed it to the executive. I've done my job, but I just pray to that. You know, they look at those recommendations and implement them. But Otherwise, one thing a lot of Nigerians may not be happy with is the Ways and Means and how you and your colleagues handled it. But I want to tell you something about Ways and Means. Mm. A lot of us were against it. I was against it. I was against Ways and Means. Number one, it was a violation of the provision of the CBN Act. Okay? And then you needed to accumulate. CBN Act itself is per year 5%. And government had gone far beyond. So there were a lot of wrong so things went, that went on over the everything years. Everything went wrong. There was everybody, including the state government. Shouldn't we be bringing the people to got book? Billions out of, Those out who have been involved in all of these wrong doings with, with the nation's money. And Governor Basaki was crying that they were printing money. It comes out to be true. Let me tell you, Governor Basaki was right. He was Senator, right. let's anchor on that. Yeah. We'll be digging into more, much of that. Uh, uh, this week, by God's grace, on this program. Thank you so much. Thank you. Senator Matthew much, Hirohide, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Time. Thank you for Appreciate seeing you again. Thank you. My pleasure. We take a break, everyone. When we come back, President Tunubu in the campaign promised that there will be massive jobs in the digital sector. Now, there is a signing into law of a new a bill called the Data Protection Bill. They say that immediately that law will provide 500,000 jobs. How? We'll be finding out after this break, everyone. Can us again.
awesome. Welcome back, everyone. Part of the new law signed by the president, Bala Tinubu, is the data protection law, which he assented to on the 12th of uh, June. That is a Monday. Uh, the new law established the Nigeria Data Protection Commission, which saw the automatic fusion of or transition of the Nigeria Data Protection Bureau into a commission and to be headed by a national commissioner and a CEO. The institution is said uh, to, uh, that it were about 500,000 jobs are expected to be created through the training of data protection officers and licensing of data protection compliance organization to offer services to data controllers and processors. The new act is said to be one of the strategic ways of meeting the campaign promise of Tinubu to create one million jobs in the digital economics uh, sector. Tonight, I'm being joined by the National Commissioner of the Nigeria Data Protection Commission, Dr. Vincent Olatunji. Thank you so much indeed for joining us tonight on the program. Thank you for having me. Yeah. First and foremost, uh, because we've had conversation around uh, cutting cost of governance and uh, duplicity and multiplicity of, uh, of uh, government agencies at a point that Nigeria cannot afford it because we don't really have the money to run a bogus government size, the kind of size of government that we have. So the question is, why another commission or agency of government? Shouldn't this just be um, a department under the Ministry of Communications or something? Uh, thank you very much. You know, globally now, we are talking of global digital economy. And the global digital economy, obviously, some... Organizations that are no more relevant in the global digital economy will go, while others that are relevant in the global digital economy will, 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 will come up. And it's all about reskilling and retooling in order for us to be relevant in the global digital economy. For instance, I studied geography and planning, my first degree, my second degree, and my, even my PhD. But when I discovered that I wanted to work in the digital economy sector, I did my advanced diploma, advanced diploma in computer studies, when the issue of data protection came up. I did my certification in data protection, and I'm a certified public-private partnership strategist. And now I'm even a member of Forbes Technology Council. So moving from geography, core geography, to technology, to privacy, to a lot of things. So this is so a new just, area that the world is, is still moving to, towards. towards. Yes. So and, and you look at some of the top major uh, economic cash cow in the U.S., for example. You talk about the apples of this world. Uh, the Meta, the Facebook, the Instagram, Twitter, these are cash cows. These are the ones that are driving the major economies around the globe. And so this is the area where Nigeria needs to go. Absolutely. And this is the global trend. But are we ready for it? We are ready because if we are talking of having about over 200 million people, who want to forego online on a regular basis to exchange our data, to share our data, to have access to some services. So there is need for us as a country to have a law that we can really trust and confidence, whatever we are doing online, to ensure that our rights, our freedoms, and interests of data subjects who are Nigerians are adequately protected. And more importantly, it is now a human rights issue that where you do anything online, your data, your privacy must be adequately protected. And in Africa, we are not just starting in Africa. In Africa, as far back as 2014, there was this Balabo Convention on Cyber Security and Data Protection, mandating all 54 African countries to have their data protection laws and their data supervisory authority. Why the, the institution is important is it's one thing for you to have a law. It's a completely different thing for you to have it implemented. If you don't have a supervisory authority, the issue of adequacy is not there. Because the thing is that you must have your law which will provide the legal framework for safeguards for your data where you do want in the data line. A completely different thing is for you to have a DPA, data protection authority, an independent data protection authority. That is the trend globally. And in Africa, as we speak today, 34 countries now have their principal laws in the area of data privacy and protection, while 23 have their data law, uh, protection laws, and their data uh, privacy authority as a result of Malabo Convention. Even at the level of West Africa, as far back as 2020, there was this supplementary act for West African countries to have their data protection authority and their laws. And one thing that is really important and original to us in Nigeria, the model that we have adopted, 
is at no cost to government. It's going to be a self-funding organization in Nigeria, How? Where will a revenue generation. Where will you be getting the funds from? Now, the model we adopted, I said PPP. I told you I'm a PPP strategist. Mm -hmm. So when we started this implementation, the idea that I brought was that we should have a PPP model for so many reasons. One, the level of technological development in Nigeria. Two, our population, our size as a country. It will be very difficult for a small government office to be able to effectively implement the regulation that we started with. That was why we started with the PPP model where we license DPCOs, data protection compliance organizations. What do they do? They go to organizations to offer compliance as a service for them to be able to comply with the provisions of the law. Through that, organizations where they offer services to will file the annual report with us. And during the course of filing, they pay annual filing fee to us. And licensing DPCOs is not cheap, it's not free. They have to pay their licensing fees. The grants and fines that will definitely come up between where we started and now, without a law, in less than one year, we were able to bring in over 200 million naira to government. That was where we didn't even have a law. Now we have a law. We have an instrument to operate. Uh, just about a month ago, EU fined Meta 1.3 billion euro. And you know what that means to that economy? The US government, through the FTC, just fined Microsoft about two years ago, 20 million dollars for data breaches. So these were around data privacy, data protection, data breaches, they are huge. That any single breach will lead to a lot of issues for there, a, a number of And there are issues already. Uh, let so me many, ask you. So, now, many. so the CBN gave a regulation, I mean, gave a directive to commercial banks asking now that for verification of the identity of uh, bank account holders, their social media handles needs to be collected and uh, also archived and put to identify them. I mean, organization and Serap, uh, like Serap had come out to say, look, that is a gross violation of the rights of the Nigerian citizen and is a violation of the right to freedom of expression and privacy. Yeah. Are you also moving against government agencies that are seen to be violating rights of citizens? Definitely, there are provisions in law to move against any data controller, government office, uh, private sector, NGO, hotels, any organization. So you are, are you pro-government or pro-citizen? Pro-citizen. The, the whole idea about this law is to protect the rights, the freedoms, and the interests of Nigerians who are data subjects. Are in this you case. going to fight for Nigerians on this CBN Definitely. Directive. We've done a letter to CBN that what they have done, because in, in data... In data uh, uh, data protection and privacy issues, there are some basic principles that you need to follow when you want to collect uh, citizens' data. One, there's what is called data minimization. That is, you don't collect data more than for the purpose for you which you want to use it for. There is a limit to the level of data you must collect. One, purpose limitation. What purpose? Why do you really actually need somebody's data? Now, in this case, it's for financial transactions. Now, this one of now asking for their social media is not really necessary. Now, if that will happen under public interest, yes, CBN has okay, we are regulator in this sector. Under public interest, we want to use this to monitor some financial transactions. There are some guidance know that we must follow. One, there has to be a way of informing data subjects. In this case, we are bank customers. To say these are the things we want to do. Now, a new, uh, a new account will be open. You, you need to let the that we know. now we want to collect your social media handles for the purpose of this and that, for this and this and that purpose. But ideally, that should not even happen at all. So we're engaging the CBN on this and we look at the best way out of it. What would you be telling the CBN to scrap that regulation, isn't it? Yeah, we'll find that one. Why, why did that regulation come up? Then we we'll would let them know the implications of the law. Now we have a law in Nigeria, that's the Data Protection Act 2023. These are the implications. But as part of the law, the yeah, best parties, yeah. You don't collect data more than what you need. So there's no point collecting such data. So we'll definitely take them up and we'll work with them and look at the best solution out of it. And please let us know what the outcome of that. Definitely. There's a huge agitation. All and, over, uh, all over, all I'm over. Very sure we receive calls, <laughs> uh, mails from all over the world. Mm. Tell you, now you have a new law for data protection. Now your CBA is bringing out this. So mm. definitely we'll engage them. It's not just about talking or making noise. We need to engage them and look at the best way to, to, to resolve this. There are cases in some part of the world where, I mean, it's said that some government agencies eavesdrop and listen to citizens' calls. 
And, and that accusation also came up in Nigeria too. And you heard about the case of Cambridge Analytical and how data has been manipulated yeah. for political uh, re and security reasons. How protected are Nigerians about this? I mean, uh, you probably would have seen some violations by the government in the past that we have seen and heard an agitation from the Nigerian people. What would you like to say to that? Yeah, I think we, 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 we've moved from where we were to a new era now. There's a paradigm shift now where we didn't have the law. But in fact, it's even a constitutional provision, Section 37 of the Federal Constitution of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria has amended. Speak to the issue of your privacy, your right to privacy. So that we are not even doing it because we didn't have an institution to fully bring this to life. That was why all these violations have been seen. Now that you have this act, which is derived from Section 37 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, we are now fully out to ensure that these rights, the privileges and freedoms are adequately taken care of. For, on the behalf of Nigerians. As one of the security, uh, security, uh, security agencies that was said to have uh, acquired um, an equipment to be able to listen to citizens' calls, are you aware of, uh, has there been any kind of petition from, from Nigerian citizens to say these are their worries? Because when that kind of thing happened, Nigerians will question, Nigerians have raised raise their eyebrow about some of these issues. Now, the thing is, in the law that we have now, even if that will happen, maybe for natural security, for instance, that, okay, for, because of some security issues, they want to get some information, they want to get some data. There are procedures, guidelines of which the bureau is only, already working out, and we need to work with this organization. To, okay, if you want to do this, there are some basic things that we need to follow, which are like guidance, like rules, like guidelines, which we are going to issue that will work. And that is why I said, this, I'll be saying it several, several days, that this is not something that you just sit in your corner as the DPA and say, oh, you want to issue guidance. You need to engage this government organization. Because a lot of them don't even understand. So every... Allow privacy and so data protection. From, from, your, from, the, uh, from the new law now, you are saying that every organization must have a data protection agent or officer. Data protection officer, yes. That's what is going to happen. Yes. So it's mandatory. It is mandatory. Section 32 of the law says, as a data controller of major importance, you must have a resident DPO, data protection officer. If that doesn't happen, what's the consequence? Against the law, that's a breach. We'll take you up. So when are you, when are you going to start effectively uh, uh, using the, 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 this law? The first thing is to give them six months after the law has taken effect for them to register with us, all the data controllers and persons in the country. Which 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 are. The organization that affected is it every private organization every, in nigeria not only private every organization if you collect and process the data of nigerians you are affected uh, public sector companies oil companies telcos. banks telcos insurance companies hotels hospitals pharmaceutical companies industry manufacturing industry everybody and those who, those who text us and uh, advocate for things that we don't need it does is that a breach too it is it is if they profile you, that you will not play your spending ability or your spending uh, preference may be in line with this area and the profile you, and you can card. Well, can citizens sue? Yes, yeah, you, you can. You can. You can report to us. You, one of your officers, uh, Mr. Bangui, has said that uh, the data protection law will immediately create about 500,000 jobs. Where are these coming from? Yeah, that's one interesting thing about this digital economy sector. You no know, part of the campaign promises of Mr. President was that is going to create one million jobs from the digital economy sector alone. Now, in Nigeria, there was a survey we carried out. We have over 500,000 data processors and controllers in the country. And the law says each of you must have a DPO. The question now is, do you have qualified DPOs? The answer is no. Those of us that are certified DPOs in Nigeria, we are not up to 10,000. Whereas, we have jobs of 500,000 people. How do you want to do that? That is why the number two agenda that I want to pursue is capacity building. How do we build capacity? How do we train people to be able to service this market, which is really available? And the good thing about this sector, the fact that you don't need to be a law, a, law, a legal practitioner, you don't need to be a core tech person before you can really be a DPO. All you need to do is to attend your training, write your exams, 
then you continue to learn on the job. Mm -hmm. You acquire the necessary skills to serve as a DPO. So it is mandatory for all of them to have DPOs. The other part is the data protection compliance organizations, DPCOs, that we license to carry out compliance on that behalf. An average DPCO will engage, employ five people. And that today we have licensed 160. And this can increase up to 1,000. Mm. That is another means of creating jobs. So and uh, platform, every organization should be ready. What, what is the time that you give six all months. of the, uh, six, six months. months? So that will be so, by the end of this year? Uh, this year. Because the filing for this year should occur and end between January 1st and 31st of March next year. Like, so all your data protest activities, whatever you have done in terms of compliance, file data protesting and everything, you must file your uh, report with us later by 31st of March. 2024. You, you need to come out to give Nigerians this information for a lot of organizations that are involved in this. So quickly, I have just a few questions that I needed to ask you within the short time that we have. Some persons argue that Nigeria's digital system is not sophist sophisticated enough. How does your agency intend to ensure the success of this law? Now, the, the, it's not, this law is not about the sophistication of our digital technologies in the country. It's all about legal issues around the collection, processing, storage, sharing, and everything that has to do with data. Are you, do you have a means by monitoring? Yes. I, I just told you that we have, let's say, DPCOs. No, I apart from that, do now, you have digital way of monitoring? Yes, uh, we are available on all social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. You can report to us there. They're on our portal. There is a, a place where you can lodge reports and we take it up immediately and we, we invite where we, any organization is called. And between where we started and now, even without a law, we've investigated about seven banks and three of them have paid fines. And as much as we don't want to announce these fines so that it won't lead to job loss or lack of trust for this organization, what we tell you, pay remediation fee, we take you through remediation for a period of six months, we monitor you. All we are trying to preach is the culture mm -hmm of compliance. So your agency is country. not able to independently and remotely detect breaches, no, are you? No, you have to Until it has to be reported. It has to be reported. Are you trying to go to that level where you can be able to detect and remotely monitor it, who it, and... It, 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 it's, because it's not only on, in, on Nigerian soil that people yeah. breach this kind of law. People from any part of the if world... If it happens, world. it has to do with somebody, a mm -hmm. group of people. So the person or that group to report to us, they will take action. If it happens, I just keep quiet. We can't. That's something we can so do. So you see any citizens? We see the citizens because it is their right. We are talking about them now. It's all about the citizens, not even government now. Mm. It's about the citizens, either an individual, a group, or a church, whatever. It's all about that. So this is civil and criminal. It can be civil, it can be criminal. Yes, so yes. It, you, you have criminalized yes. this in some yes, way. Because people can even be jailed. Hmm. All right. <laughs> Dr. Vincent Olatunji is a national commissioner and the CEO of the Nigeria Data Protection Commission. Thank you so much. I wish you the very best in your endeavor. Thank you. Thank the you CBN uh, and uh, those uh, unwarranted calls and SMS, Nigerians really would like to see uh, what you are doing about it. Definitely. Thank you so much indeed for coming. Thank you. That's our show for tonight, everyone. Many thanks, everyone, for watching. I'm sure, Akimale, I'll see you tomorrow again at 7. Bye-bye.